Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Wahid Ansari from Cleveland, United States. After receiving his medical degree from Iran University of Medical Sciences in Tehran, Dr. Ansari joined Howard Medical School's Orthopedic Biomechanics Laboratory in Boston for a postdoctoral research fellowship in orthopedic biomechanics. During the same period, he completed a postgraduate master's degree in translational research from the Howard Medical School. He then completed his internship and orthopedic residency at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Cleveland Clinic and a fellowship in children and blood surgery at the Rothman Institute of Thomas Jefferson University. He returned to Cleveland after completing his fellowship. He is currently an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery and division head of orthopedics at the Marymount Hospital. Dr. Intazari is very active in shoulder and elbow research and has authored a number of publications, several book chapters, and he regularly presents his research at regional and national conferences. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Wahid Intazari from Cleveland. Over to Wahid. Thank you, Dr. Gopalan. Um, as, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm one of the shoulder and elbow surgeons at Cleveland Clinic, and uh, it's an honor to be asked uh, to talk about a scapula fracture after reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. Here are a list of my disclosures, and they're, none of them are relevant to the topic of this talk. Hopefully today we'll review the presentation of scapular fractures, why they have, are important, what causes them, how to treat, diagnose, prevent, treat, and also we'll have some case discussions at the end. Our case one is a 73-year-old female with typical comorbidities. Uh, she's 10 weeks after a reversal shoulder arthroplasty for irreparable cuff tear and was uh, doing really well uh, after reverse total shoulder arthroplasty 10 till her four days ago. And we know injury or trauma uh, in her last physical therapy session started having pain in the shoulder. And now she's unable to raise her shoulder and do her activities of daily living and comes back to your clinic. In the case two is a 76 year old right hand dominant gentleman with history of coronary artery disease and a bunch of other comorbidities. And he underwent also a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty with a different implant uh, with an only tray. And uh, he was actually doing really well the first two years after surgery till he had a fall three days ago and sustained a type B periprosthetic humeral fracture and a type two displaced acromial fracture. We'll hopefully review these cases at the end and we'll review some pearls and treatment of these uh, fractures through these cases. One clarification I need to make before moving forward is that the topic of this talk is not about all acromial pathologies uh, that patients might present with. We're not talking about os acromia, we're not talking about primary scapular fractures that uh, can happen prior to reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. Jill Walsh and his group have a seminal paper on this topic and show that these type of abnormal uh, findings in the acromion are quite common and can be up, uh, present in up to 10% of patients after uh, reverse total uh, prior, prior to getting a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. And although these fractures and os acromia can get displaced uh, after reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, these patients who present with these uh, injuries prior to surgery have no difference in their constant score and forward elevation and usually have good outcome after reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. Hence, the topic of this talk is someone that doesn't have any uh, fracture and developed a fracture after reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. A quick review of the literature uh, is a very useful that uh, how we have evolved in terms of paying attention to these complications. Uh, since 2005, which these uh, fractures only uh, presented as part of uh, early series of reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. For example, Pascal Boileau and uh, Gerber in their uh, small series uh, also mentioned that some of the patients developed a chromial stress fracture and scapular stress fractures. The first uh, case report published in 2007 in almost a typical patient for these fractures that uh, had an RSA, was doing well, and four months later, after a day of heavy work, he heavy work at yard, uh, her backyard uh, started having pain and uh, found to have acromial stress fractures. 
Uh, in 2011 and 2013, we uh, have we see papers come up to classify these fractures. And in between 2013 and 2020, uh, we see mostly single institution, uh, single implant cohort reports of these fractures to uh, try to identify predictors. And it's only more recently that we see multi institutions uh, with large series of patients are trying to identify predictors of the fra these fractures uh, using multiple implants and giving us better insight as uh, why these fractures happen and how to prevent them. Scapular fractures present in 4% of primary RSAs. They commonly occur in the first one year and majority of them mainly in the first six months after the surgery. We started referring to these fractures as stress fractures, but it's uh, important to notice that one third to two third of these fractures are actually associated with an injury uh, that includes a ground level fall or a difficult uh, day in the physical therapy, and they're essentially injury related. Uh, a lot of these fractures are undiagnosed when they happen, and the clinician usually miss them. In a series that we currently have under review, if there was no history of injury, that point out the clinician to pay attention to fractures around the reversed shoulder arthroplasty, there was three times higher chance of these fractures being missed, resulting in a median delay of nine months in diagnosis. Uh, the other term that is important to mention is a term coined by Sorena Namdari and Rotman Group, and it's called stress reaction. This can also happen with high frequency up to 6% after reversed total shoulder arthroplasty, and essentially is the same clinical presentation of a chromial fracture with tenderness to palpation, decline in function, and uh, um, delay in progression in, to a PT, but no imaging finding of a fracture, and they call it a stress reaction. It's very important to pay attention to these presentations when you're examining your patients. Uh, essentially, any patient after reverse total shoulder arthroplasty that presents with new onset of pain uh, in the first six months should be should assume to have an acromial stress fracture until proven otherwise. Uh, the clinical examination uh, should include a palpation of the acromion in the back of the shoulder. This is not a common area that we usually examine in our patients. And when you start systematically doing that, realize that how many patients are actually uncomfortable or tender in that area. And that might help to identify patients that have prodromal symptoms of a chromial stress fracture uh, and maybe slowing down, down, them down through their rehab. Uh, the main mode of diagnosis remains to be an X-ray in these cases, but uh, when the patient has clinical presentation with no imaging X-ray findings of uh, these fractures, getting more advanced imaging like CT and MRI is indicated. Two classification sim, sim, uh, systems that we uh, earlier pointed out uh, are out there. First one is uh, Crosby's that mainly is an anatomic classification and uh, classifies these fractures to type one, which are very distal and essentially fragmentation of the tip of the acromion, which usually have very minimal clinical consequences. Type twos uh, who are slightly more medial at the level of the AC joint and the most proximal ones are type threes that usually extend to the scapular spine. A second classification system that was popularized by Levy and is more commonly used is trying to classify these fractures based on uh, the amount of deltoid insertion that uh, they involve. The type one is only involves anterior and some of the lateral deltoid. Type two involves majority of the anterior lateral and some of the posterior uh, head of the deltoid, and type three is essentially uh, involves the entire deltoid and uh, putting more emphasis on uh, functional consequences of these fractures uh, when we go from type one to type three, and it's more commonly used. Why these scapular fractures are important? Uh, first of all, they're very common. Uh, with recent changes that we have made in the design of the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty or some of the preoperative planning or uh, steps that we use in the operating room, we have been able to reduce a lot of complications to some uh, negligible uh, incidences after reverse total shoulder arthroplasty in modern design. 
But as you can see, uh, still reverse total shoulder arthroplasty is associated with high level of complications. And the top of the list is acromial uh, and scapular fractures. And this is important because, uh, you know, infection, loosening and instability are uh, happening at lower frequency. And this is the most common complications in the modern design reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. Secondly, we know that scapular fractures affect outcome. This is an example of a study that done by Frankel's group that shows that patients who had uh, stress fractures or uh, scapular fractures had uh, higher pain, lower patient reported outcome, lower range of motion, lower satisfaction, and although it did not reach a clinical significant, they had higher rate of revision due to base plate loosening and instability. So it's very important to pay attention to these uh, uh, preoptively. But Let's focus on what might have we learned from literature that causes these fractures. And I'm going to talk about patient factors and surgical factors separately. In the patient factor category, uh, multiple studies show that female patients are at increased risk of a chromial stress fracture. Uh, and uh, this is a study done at Rothman Institute on a large series of RSAs, and they observed 40 fractures and 61 stress reactions, and total of 10% of patients had uh, one or uh, one of these symptoms in their follow-up. And uh, in their series, female sex was one of the very strong predictors of uh, scapular fractures. Second factor is osteoporosis. This was uh, first identified by Frankel's group as one of the important predictors of uh, uh, stress fracture and was seen in multiple following studies as an independent predictor of uh, stress uh, scapula fracture. Primary diagnosis is also important. This is the largest series to date uh, done by ASCS complications of RSA. It's a multi-center group and they looked at scapula and acromial uh, fractures separately. And as you can see, the rotator cuff tear arthropathy and inflammatory arthritis, both of them are predictors of scapula fracture. When we think about why might uh, be, uh, you know, this is, might be the case is, this is an interesting study done by HSS group that shows that when a cuff tear arthropathy or inflammatory arthritis uh, significantly uh, progresses, or when the patient has history of uh, surgery that CA ligament might be surgically removed, we might be compromising the ring uh, of structures in the shoulder that might dissipate the forces that are uh, caused by deltoid, and we might be causing more unopposed forces on the acromion that might lead to the fracture. And it's a um, cadaver study, but it's a very thought-provoking finding. And finally, post-operative injuries. Uh, we tend to not pay attention to this when we are uh, um, booking uh, patients for reverse total shoulder arthroplasty and is usually underdiagnosed. Uh, Greg Satanovich and, uh, and um, Julie Bishop's group in Ohio State show that at least 10% of patients have a major fall in the first 90 days after reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. And in the Niffler's group, uh, in Niffler's report of uh, acromial stress fractures after reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, upward of like, you know, two thirds of patients uh, with scapula fractures had an injury or fall uh, as the mode of uh, their injury. And uh, this is an important finding that we pay attention to these patients that are frequently falling. And a good portion of these fractures might not be just pure stress fractures and they're true fractures as a result of fall. But when we go to the surgical factors, uh, what are the predictors of scapula fractures from a surgical standpoint? Crosby was the first person to uh, notice that type three uh, scapula fractures, uh, uh, first of all, were associated with trauma, but also they identified that most of them uh, are, can be tracked to a stress riser from the posterior superior screw in the base plate. Otto et al. in their series, independent of the findings of Crosby, showed that 14 out of the 16 uh, scapular spine type three fractures had an initiation of the fracture from one of the screws in the base plate. 
Uh, Rotman and Exact Tech Group showed that the number of screws that was placed in the base plate was associated or was correlated with the incidence of fracture. And when Crosby's group went back and avoided putting the superior base plate screw, they reduced the incidence of their scapular fractures significantly. So this is probably one of the uh, modifications we can make surgically to avoid the scapular, the large scapular spine fractures. Uh, I'm going to present a series of uh, cadaver studies, mostly based on uh, biomechanical uh, testing on cadaver. And obviously there is some limitation of transferring these inf this information to clinical application, but this is the best uh, information we have so far. And one of the factors that was uh, identified by Larry Glotta and HSS group in their cadaveric study was deltoid tensioning. And they showed that when deltoid lengthening is more than 25% increases the strain over the acromial spine significantly. Also, the ASEAN group uh, out of France showed that when their uh, reversal in their surgeries, they switched to a 145 degree neck shaft angle with an onlay design, uh, with, which naturally puts more tension on the deltoid, their rate of acromial stress fractures went higher. And finally, in Cho et al., which did a radiographic analysis of a series of patients who had acromial stress fracture, then deltoid lengthening was one of the predictors of the uh, acromial stress fracture. When possible, we should avoid excessive deltoid lengthening in these patients. Another interesting finding was is the glenosphere lateralization. Uh, obviously, this is a new uh, change in our um, reversal of shoulder arthroplasty design uh, to avoid notching and potentially increasing our internal and external rotation uh, range of motion. But we might have been causing uh, uh, more stress on the acromion region, as uh, was shown by George Athball's group, that um, when the lateralization was more than 10 millimeters, uh, the region that's most commonly fractured in type 2 Levy fractures might be at uh, increase, ha, shows increased stress in an FEA analysis. One of the criticisms for this paper is that uh, this is a lateralization added on top of a Gramont style RSA design and not necessarily uh, shows the stress uh, uh, says that acromion region sees in a true uh, lateral uh, center of rotation uh, implant design. But overall, again, this is one of the few uh, biomechanical studies or FEA studies that we have the uh, data to uh, hinge some of our decisions on. And the final uh, point that I wanted to discuss is a superior impingement. Um, we don't have a lot of clinical data or even biomechanical data on this topic, but this is a common um, you know, um, finding that you encounter in, in the operating room when you're doing more of a lateralized center rotation uh, reversal of shoulder arthroplasties is that uh, as it, I've simplified in this picture, that as you have gone from a Gramont style with 155 neck shaft angle with no distal lateralization of the center of the rotation to more newer designs of the implant that pushes the center of rotation lateral and goes to 135 neck shaft angle, we might have uh, solved our notching problem and there's no less and less impingement in these designs in the, uh, between the poly and the neck of the glenoid. But as you can see, we're uh, reducing the impingement free range of motion and forward elevation and abduction in these designs that at some point might uh, come at the cost of contact between the greater tuberosity and acromion and create a new mode of uh, impingement in our newer design reversal of shoulder arthroplasty. As I said, clinical data on this topic is limited, uh, but uh, in my opinion, this is something that we need to be aware of uh, both in interoperatively and in our studies going forward. So how to prevent these uh, fractures? I think it's one of the important factors to consider uh, uh, is the patient selection. When you look, look at these individual factors, they usually uh, are go hand in hand in some patients. Osteoporosis, cuff tear arthropathy, female, uh, petite females. This, these usually uh, makes, makes up a large portion of our patient that re receive reversal shoulder arthroplasty. And when you look closely, 
that specific patient might have higher than 15% risk of acromial stress fracture. And we know those, if that fracture happens, these patients won't have good uh, outcomes. So it's very important to select the patients that are at reasonable risk. And secondly, assess the patient's fall risk after surgery, um, because that's another underdiagnosed and under uh, um, recognized problem uh, that these patients deal with because they frequently falling because of other uh, difficulties in balance and ambulation. And uh, truly in a very high risk patient, we might wanna consider a different option than a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. As my mentor, uh, Joe Ayanadi, uh told me once is that your outcome as a surgeon depends more on who you operate than what you are doing in the operating room most of the time. And this might be an example of uh, choosing the right patient for reverse total shoulder arthroplasty might be the most important decision that a surgeon uh, can uh, make to reduce the risk of these fractures. But when the fracture, when we're in the operating room or we're planning for our reverse shoulder replacement, what are the factors that we can pay attention to to avoid uh, these fractures? First of all, it seems that putting this screw in the posterior superior quadrant is very clearly associated with uh, uh, type three acromial stress fractures. I think this is also important to note that with more intraoperative guidance and things like uh, uh, navigation, we will be able to put our screws at a place that will not notch the acromial stress fracture and reduces this uh, risk of uh, uh, stress rises on the acromion. Uh, we should avoid excessive lateralization. Probably the number is around 10, 10 millimeter, but take the actual numbers with some grain of salt. And excessive distalization beyond 25 millimeter are uh, metrics to stick with. And if you're using a lateral center of rotation, you should avoid using an onlay design because this creates excessive uh, uh, tension over the acromion. And finally, maybe superior impingement is a new mode of failure uh, for our reverses that we should avoid because that might uh, limit a range of motion and cause acromial stress fracture. As far as treatment, uh, I'm still... Uh, uh, very uh, torn is how to treat these fractures because there is not a lot of good uh, evidence out there to guide this decision. And uh, um, because early attempts at fixing these fractures was associated with high failure rate, uh, we have retracted to treating all these fractures non-operatively. And as I will show, probably that is also not a not good option for our patients. So when these fractures happen, uh, generally we immobilize the patients for six weeks and put them in an alter sling with slight abduction to take the tension off of the uh, deltoid and also avoid active forward elevation and abduction. And surgery only becomes indicated if the patients continue to have symptoms despite non-operative treatment. And I personally have become more aggressive with displaced type twos and large type three fractures. This is a level uh, six or seven evidence, but personally in my practice, if you have a type one and the fragment is a small, I am resecting those pieces or treating them very similar, like an symptomatic OSAC chromial with the screws and tension band. And the type twos and threes, I've moved to using uh, 90, 90 double plating. And uh, it's very important that my personal, my, our institution's experience shows that if you fix these uh, fractures with non-locking plates and maybe single plate, there's higher risk of um, failure, but this is something that we're still uh, collecting data and we'll be publishing soon on it. Going back to our cases, our case one that developed a chromial stress fracture, I, uh, we treated non-operatively and we stopped her physical therapy, gave her six weeks of immobilization and ultra sling and uh, asked her not to do any forward elevation and abduction. And in uh, following months, initially her pain slightly got better and encouraged me to get her back to physical therapy. But as you can see in the final x-rays, this patient's fracture was displaced and she was left with very limited forward elevation. and. Um, uh, still had tenders to palpation at the site at the site of the fracture, although did not have pain with daily uh, activities and did not want it to undergo further surgery. But this is a case that uh, 
exemplifies non-operative treatment probably uh, has um, is less an ideal outcome, and we might be, I mean, we should be thinking about you know treating these fractures differently. Going back to our fracture, obviously, uh, case with fracture, we have multiple options of treating the fracture non-operatively or fixing the humeral shaft and uh, leaving the chromial uh, fracture. But I thought that this patient had such a good outcome that leaving any of these fractures will not be in his best interest non-operatively. So we attempted to fix both of these fractures. For ORIF of the type two fractures, this is the typical way that I treat these fractures. When you remove the, uh, open up the skin through a longitudinal incision, you uh, get to the fracture site. Uh, it's very important to clean the fracture site and um, show, uh, as, as it's shown in this video, remove all the scar and potential non-union that might uh, have, have been developed. And I personally put a series of sutures at the junction of the deltoid and the uh, distal fragment. And this allows better control of the fragment when it comes to plating. I use a con uh, compression uh, device uh, to compress the fracture site and put two K wires through the fracture to keep the fracture reduced. And then use the contralateral uh, lateral uh, clavicle plate that has good fitting uh, on this uh, fracture and pass all the sutures that I pass through the junction of the deltoid and the distal uh, fragment through this uh, plate and uh, perform a double plating. As you can see here, we uh, performed a 90, 90 degree plating and added a circlage uh, tape on top of the double plate construct to keep the fracture um, uh, from uh, the distal fragment to tilt inferiorly. And this patient went on to heal the fracture uh, uh, after a period of immobilization and uh, his final follow-up, which was uh, three months, the chromial stress fracture was uh, fully healed as well as uh, abundant callus formation around uh, his uh, shaft. So to summarize, uh, our take-home message is that scapular fractures after reverse are common and need to be discussed with the patient preoperatively. Uh, they're commonly missed and a treating physician should have high index of suspicion for these fractures to diagnose them uh, um, appropriately. Small female with osteoporosis and diagnosis of cuff tear arthropathy or inflammatory arthropathy are high risk for these scapular fractures. And we have to do appropriate risk assessment and patient selection for these, uh, uh, for our reversal of shoulder arthroplasties. Um, I personally try to work up my patients with uh, preoperative physical therapy for fall risk and potentially doing some therapy to improve patient's balance and reduce the risk of injury and fall after reverse shoulder replacement. Surgically, it's better to avoid posterior superior uh, base plate screws and uh, avoid superior impingement uh, in our planning and also intraoperatively avoid putting reverses in excessive tension and excessive lateralization. And unfortunately, evidence to how to guide to treat, guide our treatment of these fractures are limited, but perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, we have to come up with better ways of surgically fixing these fractures because uh, non-operative treatment of scapular fractures do not result in good outcome for the patients. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Wahid, for that amazing presentation. Uh, why the, actually you can stop sharing your screen? Absolutely. Sorry, just give me one second. Great. Uh, why a couple of questions from our side. Now, what is the current angle that you prefer? Is the neck shaft angle, like you mentioned, the lesser the angle, the slightly lesser incidence of a scapular fracture, right? So, you know, the, the problem with current, uh, you know, studies is that uh, this is a multifactorial issue. So we have on one side, our biomechanical studies that are done in very small series of cadavers. And um, 
we know that there's limitation of applying those principles to clinical practice. And our clinical information data um, also very sporadic. Most of them are done in single design and not necessarily you have the chance of comparing different design through the same study. And uh, also most of them are done on X-ray measurements, which we know are very inaccurate in uh, actually measuring where the center of rotation of the reverse is, how much exact distalization uh, you know, uh, we apply. So I would say um, the largest series of uh, you know, these fractures have been reported through that uh, um, ASCS uh, complication group suggests that potentially maybe lateralization of the center of rotation uh, might be associated with higher rate of uh, chromial stress fractures. And I wanted to point that out, but uh, generally speaking, we don't have a good consensus as like, you know, should you be using a 155, 145 or 135? It almost like currently, because none of these parameters are optimized, you kind of pick your complications with any of these uh, you might be fixing one problem and adding a notching and dislocation and impingement. Uh, so um, I, I think in general, in reverse shoulder replacement, uh, opposite to the anatomic shoulder replacement, we just try to reconstruct the anatomy. In reverse shoulder replacement, our, uh, we, we have more of a reactionary uh, uh, you know, approach that we first wanted to make the reverse work and then we realized that we, what we made the reverse work created a bunch of complications. And now we're in the journey to avoid those complications and maybe in the, in the process creating a different set of complications. So I think personally speaking, you will see surgeons use like, you know, implants that they feel comfortable with. I, I've been trained with, uh, you know, more newer design implants. I use a 135 neck shaft angle a design, uh, but for my fractures, I use a different implant and tend to use a 145 neck shaft angle. So the challenge you, you, you run into is that the rate of these fractures are so low that like, you know, happened like, you know, four, three out of every hundred patients that a single surgeon relying on their own experience usually make bad decisions about, you know, solving a problem that's, you know, infrequent. And we need these larger series, bigger studies that hope, you know, thankfully they're coming out and we'll be able to, um, you know, account because as I said, these uh, factors like condense in certain patients. On that patient that you had to over tension their reverse is the same patient that have cuff tear arthropathy and no cuff left because you're worried that they're gonna dislocate, you tension their reverse and they happen to be a female with osteoporosis. And so when you, purely looking at one variable, a single factor, you're probably missing the, you know, real uh, relationships and real predictors. So I think with more studies, bigger studies, we're going to um, get to there. So I personally use a 135 next shaft angle, try to not super lateralize in my high risk patients. That's how I do it. Thank you, Wahid, for that. Uh, another one that is part of a continuum of what we already discussed, I hosted uh, Prof. Frederick Matson from Seattle in the past, and uh, one of the problems that he highlighted was the explosion in the number of reverse shoulder arthroplasties being done in the U.S., and he was like, kind of, uh, surgeons are considering it kind of a panacea for everything, like, okay, you have a problem, okay, let's go ahead with the reverse. So is that a concern uh, in your thought process? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I try to emphasize that with the patient selection uh, uh, part is that currently we don't have really a good solution for a chromial stress fracture. And as I said, in some subsets of the patients that go through throughout through the reverse, and they're not uncommon, you're female, uh, small stature uh, with osteoporosis that has cuff tear arthropathy, and some, you know, cohorts make up 50% of your uh, patients that are going through reverse shoulder replacement. Then when you're looking at these individual predictors and then like add them up, all of a sudden the risk is no longer 4%, risk is 15%, 20% for that patient that is in front of you. And I think not discussing it is almost criminal. And also 
uh, not taking that into account. You know, there's not a lot of surgeries that there's 20% risk of failure and we keep still keep doing them uh, with no uh, kind of change in the practice. I think I personally have uh, offered HEMIs and some of my patients that I think they're super uh, high risk and also they're low demand. And I know, you know, if the chromium is like paper thin from erosion and they're uh, osteoporotic, just looking for pain relief. Uh, so I think those are the modifications that we can make. And the challenge becomes that now we're kind of expanding the indication of reverse, doing reverse in younger patients, more active patients. And we might be not seeing the stress reaction, stress fractures, but maybe we're, we're going to see the true fractures like now, like these people are active, we're going to do uh, more uh, risky uh, activities and are going to break their acromion. And I think it's, that's also a good distinction to make is that uh, not all scapular fractures are made equal. So some of them are truly stress fractures and some of them are acute fractures that you should be fixing. Thank you, Wahid, for that. Just one last question before we wind up the session. Now, what are your current indications for a reverse? Now, the classical indication has always been a cuff tear arthropathy. Then people start adding like fractures and arthritis, even arthritis. People have moved from the anatomical to reverse to say that the role of an anatomical shoulder is very less. I don't know. I'm, you know, I've not been uh, in practice for a long time, but I'm, I tend to be a little bit of a kind of um, old school in terms of how I see this still, maybe with more uh, data coming out that we newer designs of the reverse, we have been able to reduce the complications. But still, I think uh, when you look at the overall complication rate of reverse shoulder replacement is almost double uh, of the same time frame of follow-up as the anatomic. And uh, I mean, you can cherry pick and you know show the bad outcomes of certain designs of the anatomic and put them next to reverses and say, oh, there is no difference. And you know some of the studies uh, that try to account for these, uh, but they're still retrospective studies, make me a little bit worried about, you know, kind of taking that and now recommending reverse to, to masses. I think reverse uh, has made a huge difference in uh, the pain control and creating, you know, um, um, decent function for some of the patients that they used to have no option or very limited options. And I think still is a very reliable option for pain control for a lot of my low demand patients. But I think these recent changes that we have made in indications and application of reverse to a lot of newer patient populations, I think we should uh, learn from our mistakes in the past of introducing a technology too fast. And before we know the consequences, starting, you know, recommending to masses. I think anatomic remains the gold standard in my practice for uh, glenohumeral arthritis. And I still um, every day feel that that, you know, as a great surgery that gives great range of motion, great uh, uh, patient relief for my patients. And uh, uh, I always try to make that leap from this gold standard to reverse shoulder replacement uh, with, uh, with some concrete data. And I think unfortunately data is scarce at this point. And uh, you know, the reverse shoulder replacement indication remains to be uh, uh, cough tear arthropathy. And uh, I mean, we have applied off-label this implant to um, almost everything under the sun from like, you know, you know, turning a fusion to reverse all the way to, you know, very, uh, you know, when you don't have an option for a patient and there are like five revisions and you have like, you know, um, you know, uh, you want to give them reasonable pain control and function. That's a very different uh, um, decision making situation of picking this implant as a primary implant for someone that's like, you know, walks in the door. And I think, you know, we sometimes kind of say, okay, so my revision cases are doing really well. You know, my, you know, cuff tear arthropathy patients are doing really well. So I think there is some data coming out that maybe, at, you know, glenohumeral arthritis with no bone loss and intact cuff is 
you know, can do as well with reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. But when that patient can get a rever can get an anatomic shoulder replacement, I still don't have enough uh, confidence in whatever is out there in terms of evidence to make that switch in my practice. Thank you, Wahid. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you for this fantastic presentation. I'm sure it's going to help a lot of people. Thank you, Wahid. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. And uh, uh, looking forward to, uh, you know, seeing you in future. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Take care.